I am Michelle Rasmussen, the Vice President of the Schiller Institute in Denmark. And I'm very happy that peace researcher Jan Erber agreed to this interview. Jan Erber was born in Denmark and lives in Sweden. He has a PhD in sociology and has been a visiting professor in peace and conflict studies in Japan, Spain, Austria, Switzerland, uh, part-time over the years. Uh, Jan Erber has written thousands of pages of published articles and several books. He is the co-founder and director of the independent TFF, the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research in Lund, Sweden, since 1985, and has been nominated over several years for the Nobel Peace Prize. Our interview today will have three parts. Uh, the danger of war with Russia and between Russia and Ukraine, which could lead to war between the United States and NATO and Russia, and how to stop it. Uh, secondly, uh, your criticism of Denmark starting negotiations with the United States on a bilateral security agreement, which could mean permanent stationing of US soldiers and armaments on Danish soil. And thirdly, your criticism of a major report, which alleged that China is committing genocide in Xinjiang province. A Russian invasion of Ukraine, which some in the West said would start last Wednesday, has not occurred. But as we speak, tensions are still very high. You wrote an article, uh, Jan Erber, on January 19th called Ukraine, the West has paved the road to war with lies, specifying three lies concerning the Ukraine crisis and let's take them one by one. You defined line number one, the West's leaders never promised Mikhail Gorbachev and his foreign minister, Edward Shavinazzi, not to expand NATO eastwards. The there's also a, a lie included that they also did not state that they would take serious Soviet or Russian security interests around its borders. And therefore, each of the former Warsaw Pact countries has a right to join NATO if they decide to freely. Can you please uh, explain more to our seers about this lie? Yes, and thank you very much for your um, <clears throat> very kind and long and detailed uh, introduction of me. Um, I would just say about that point that it, I'm amazed that this is now a kind of um, a repeated truth in Western media that Gorbachev was not given such promises. And it rests with a little um, few, few words taken out of a longer article written uh, years ago by a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, who says that Gorbachev did not say so. That article was published by Brookings Institution. Now, the truth is, and there's a difference between truth and non-truth, and we have to make that more and more clear when we deal with the West at the moment. Um, the truth is, if you go to the National Security Archives in the US, um, if I remember correctly, the George Washington University, that is well documented. Their own formulation is that there are cascades of documentation. However, this was not written down in a treaty or signed by the Western leaders who one after the other came to Gorbachev's dacha outside Moscow or visited him in Kreml, in the Kremlin. And therefore some people would say it's not valid. Now that is not true in politics if we can't uh, rely on what was said and what was written down 
by people personally on their note in their notebooks, etc. Uh, George Bush, uh, Margaret Thatcher, um, Helmut Kohl, mm, uh, James Baker. You can almost mention any important Western leader. Uh, were anonymous in saying, unanimous in saying to Gorbachev, we understand that the Warsaw Pact is gone, the Warsaw Pact, has, the, the Soviet Union has gone, and therefore we are not going to take advantage of your weakness. Uh, James Baker's formulation, according to all these sources, is we're not going to expand NATO one inch. And that was said in 8990 that is 30 years ago, and Gorbachev against those, so because of those assurances also accepted, which he's been blamed very much for since then, the reunification of Germany. Um, some sources say that was a kind of deal made that if Germany should be united, which it was very quickly after, uh, it should be a neutral country. But the interpretation in the West was it could remain a member of NATO, but would then include what was at that time the German, the, the German Democratic Republic, GDR, into one Germany. Uh, you can go to Gorbachev's foundation homepage and you will find several interviews, videos, whatever, in which he says these things. And you can go to the Danish expert, leading Danish expert in this, Jens Jörg Nielsen, who has also written that he personally interviewed Gorbachev, in which Gorbachev, with sadness in his eyes, say that he was cheated or that these promises were broken, whatever the formulation is. And I fail to understand why this being one of the most important reasons behind the present crisis, namely Russia's putting down the foot saying, you can't continue this expansion up to the border with your troops and your uh, long range missiles up to the border of Russia. And we will not accept Ukraine too. You have gotten 10 former Warsaw Pact countries who are now members of NATO. NATO has 30 members. We are here with a military uh, uh, budget, which is 8% of NATO's and you keep on this expansion. We are not accepting that expansion to include Ukraine. Now, this is so fundamental that of course it has to be denied by those who are hardliners or hawks or cannot live without enemies or want a new Cold War, which we already have in my view, have had for some years, but that's a long story. Uh, the way the West and the US in particular, but NATO's uh, Secretary General behave in this is outrageous to me because it's built on omission of one of the most important historical facts of modern Europe. Yes, uh, in, in your article, uh, you actually quote from the head of NATO, the General Secretary of NATO, back in 1990, one year before the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, Manfred Werner, uh, where you say that in these documents released by the US National Security Archive that you just referred to, uh, Manfred Werner gave a well-regarded speech in Brussels in May 1990, in which he argued, the principal task of the next decade will be to build a new European security structure to include the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact nations. The Soviet Union will have an important role to play in the construction of such a system. And uh, the next year in the middle of 1991, this according to a memorandum from the Russian delegation who met with Werner, uh, Werner he, um, he responded to the Russians by saying that he personally and the NATO Council were both against expansion. In quotes, 13 out of 16 NATO members mm -hmm. share this point of view. And he, uh, uh, Werner said that he would speak against Poland's and Romanian's membership in NATO 
to those countries leaders as he had already done with leaders of Hungary, Czechoslovakia. And um, he emphasized we should not allow the isolation of USSR from the European community. And this was even while the USSR uh, was still alive. So it, it must <laughs> have been even more the case uh, after uh, then the USSR uh, collapsed and, and Russia emerged. Well, you see, if I may, if I may put in a little point here, you see, with that quotation of a former NATO Secretary General, compare that with the present Secretary General of NATO. Uh, Werner was a man of intellect. The leaders around him at the time in Europe were too. I mean, those were the days when you had people like Willy Brandt in Germany and Ostpolitik and you had Olaf Palme in Sweden with common security thinking. We cannot in the West be sure or feel safe and secure in the West if, the, uh, if it's against Russia, which does not mean at all to give in to everything Russia does, but just says we cannot be safe if the others don't feel safe from us. And that was an intellectualism. That was an empathy, not necessarily a sympathy, but it was an empathy for those over there that we have to take into account when we act. Today, that intellectualism is gone completely. And it is very interesting, as you point out, the 13 out of 16 NATO countries at that time were at that level. But in came in 1994, um, Bill Clinton, and he basically said, well, he didn't state it, but he acted as though he had stated it. I don't care about those promises. And then he started uh, expanding NATO. And the first office of NATO was set up in Kiev in 1994. That was the year when he did that. And that was the year when I sat in Tbilisi, Georgia, Georgia and interviewed the US representative there, who through a two hour long conversation basically talked about Georgia as our country. So, you know, um, sad to say, it's human to make mistakes, but to be so uh, anti-intellectual, so anti-empathetic, so imbued with your own thinking or worldview, you're not able to take other side, the other side into account, is much more dangerous than it was at that time, because the leaders we have in the Western world today are not up to it. They were earlier, but these ones are not. Lie number two, you pointed out, the Ukraine conflict started by Putin's out of the blue aggression on Ukraine and then uh, annexation of Crimea. What's the rest of the story here? Well, it's not the rest, it's the beginning of the story. <laughs> you see, um, people who write about these things, and it's particularly those who are Western media and Western politicians and foreign ministers, etc. they say that they started all out with this out of the blue invasion uh, in the Donbass and then the taking, annexing or aggression on or whatever the word is, uh, Crimea. What they all forget very conveniently and very deliberately, they cannot I mean, this is not longer time ago than people would know who write about it today, that there was a clearly Western assisted, if not orchestrated, coup d'etat in Kiev in 2014. After, uh, I won't go into that long story, after some negotiations about uh, uh, an economic agreement uh, between Ukraine and the EU, which uh, the president then jumped off, allegedly under pressure from Putin or whatever. But there were a series of violent events in Kiev. And it's well known from one of those who were there and participated in it, namely the, I think it was called Assistance uh, Secretary of State for Europe or something like that. Uh, Mrs. Newland, that, and she's given a speech in the US where, if I remember correctly, she says that the US has pumped in $5 billion in Ukraine over the years to support democracy and uh, human rights, etc., and training courses for young NGOs, etc. And it's obvious 
that that operation, that ousting of the president, he had to flee to uh, Russia, and the taken over uh, partly by neo-Nazis and fascists who were present and who did probably the beginning of the shooting and the killing of people, that all this had to do with the promise that was given to Ukraine years before that it would be integrated into the Euro-Atlantic uh, framework and then it was kind of stopping and say we don't want that anyhow we will negotiate something else and we will look into what Putin has to offer etc but that that in Putin's mind in Russia's mind meant that NATO would be the future of Ukraine and Russia had still has a huge military base in Crimea which it had a lease on for at the time I think it was 30 plus years meaning should Ukraine which was clearly signaled by the Western NATO members leadership enter and become a full member of Ukraine then he would look at a Russian base either going being lost or you would have a Russian military uh, naval base in a NATO country. Now, I'm not saying that that was a smart move. I'm not saying it was a legal move, but it's very difficult for the Western world to uh, blame uh, Russia for annexing uh, Crimea. Um, if you look at the opinion polls and the votes for that, uh, if you will, um, voting ourselves back to Russia, you know, the whole thing was, was Russia until I think 54 or whenever when Khrushchev uh, gave it uh, to, to, uh, to Ukraine. He was from Ukraine himself. Um, and so this happened three weeks before. And I'm amazed that it should not again be intellectually possible for people who witnessed this. Uh, the other thing we talked about was 30 years ago, there might be some young fools who, who don't read history books. But th what I'm talking about was something that happened in 2014. And it's, it, it, there's no excuse for not mentioning that there's a connection between that coup d'etat and the influence of the West in Ukraine in a very substantial way and what happened in, in Donbass and, and Crimea. So I'm just saying what we're, if I put it up on a, on a more general level, if we look at today's ability to understand, describe, analyze issues as conflicts, we are heading for zero understanding. There are nobody in the press, there are nobody in politics who are able intellectually to see these things as conflicts, that is, as a problem standing between two or more parties that has to be analyzed. And conflict resolution is about finding uh, solutions that the parties we have defined as parties, and there are certainly many more than two in this very complex conflict, can live with in the future. What we are down to in banalization is there is no conflict. There's only one party, mm. Russia, that does everything bad and evil and terrible, while we are sitting in the receiving end being the good guys who've done nothing wrong in history, who could never rethink what we did or say we're sorry or change our policies because we're right. There's only one problem, that's them. We're down now to the level in which these things, also the last three months, the accusations about Russia invading Ukraine has nothing to do with conflict analysis. It is purely focusing on one party and one party by definition is not a conflict. We are not party to a relationship anymore. And that makes a huge difference, again, from the leaders and the way of thinking and the intellectual approach that existed 20, 30 years ago. And one reason for all of this is, of course, that the West is on its way down. Uh, secondly, and it feels threatened by everything that happens, anything that happens around the world. And secondly, when you have been number one in a system for a long time, you become lazy. You don't study, you don't have as good education as you should have. 
you bring up people to high levels who which have not read books because we can get away with everything we are so strong militarily and when that happens you know it's slippery slope and you are actually on board titanic hmm. yeah I this is not a defense of everything russia does what i'm trying to say is there is a partner over there and by the way they call us partners in the west we call them anything else but partners. We don't even see them. We don't listen to their interests. We didn't listen to Putin when he spoke at the Munich conference in 2007 and said, you have cheated us. And of course, when Gorbachev, 90 years old, says you have cheated us, he's not even quoted in the Western world because there's no space anymore for other views than our own. You know, this autism that is now classical of the Western security policy elite is damn dangerous. Yeah, I want to just ask you shortly about the third lie, and then we'll get into uh, what you see as the solution. Uh, the third lie you, you pointed out uh, was that NATO always has an open door to new members. It never tries to invite or drag them in does not seek expansion. It just happens because Eastern European countries since 1989 to 1990 have wanted to join without any pressure from NATO's side. And this also applies to Ukraine. And uh, in this section, you also document that Putin actually asked for Russia to join NATO. Uh, can you shortly uh, please explain your most important po point about this third lie? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> it's already there since you quoted my text. But uh, the, the fascinating thing is that you have not had a referendum in any of these new member states. The fascinating thing is in 2014, when this whole NATO membership came to its first, you know, conflictual situation in the, in the case of Ukraine, there was not a majority according to any opinion poll in Ukraine. There was not a majority. And I would say it's not a matter of 51. If, you, if a country is going to join NATO, it should be at least 75 or 80 percentages of the people saying yes to that. Third, uh, and it's not something I've invented, it is NATO's former Secretary General Robertson, who has told the story, I think it was first released in The Guardian, but it's also in a long podcast from a place I don't remember, but which The Guardian quotes. He says that he was asked by Putin whether or at what time or whatever the formulation was, NATO would accept Russia as a member. This probably goes back to what you have already quoted, Werner, the NATO Secretary General for having said, namely that a new security structure in Europe would by necessity have some kind of involvement in a direct sense of Russia, because Russia is also Europe. And that was what Gorbachev had as an idea, the new European home or house or whatever he called it, something like a security structure where we could deal with our conflicts or differences or misunderstandings, and we could still be friends in in the larger Europe. And that was why I argued at the time, uh, 30 years ago, that with the demise of Russia, uh, Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, the only reasonable thing was to close down NATO. And instead, as I said with Clinton and onwards, the whole interpretation was we have won. The Western system, the neoliberal democratic NATO system has won. We have nothing to learn from that. There's nothing to change now. We just uh, expand even more. And the first thing NATO did, as you know, was a completely illegal, also according to its own charter, invasion, uh, involvement and bombing in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was not a member, has never been a member of, of NATO. And NATO's only mission is, is paragraph five which says that we are one for all and all for one, we are going to support some member if the member is attacked. Now, it had nothing to do in Yugoslavia. That happened in 1991 and onwards, all the 90s. And you remember the bombings and 72 days of bombings, uh, Kosovo and Serbia. It had nothing to do, and there was no UN mandate for it. 
But then for this triumphalistic uh, interpretation, we can now get away with everything. Anything we want, we can do it because there's no Russia to take into account. And they, Russia could not do anything about it. China could not do anything about it at the time. And so, uh, you know, you get, you, you get into hubris and an inability to seeing your own limitations. And that is what we are coming up to now. We are seeing the boomerang coming back to NATO and the Western world for these things. And then of course, some idiots will sit somewhere and say, Jan Oberg is pro-Russian. No, I'm trying to stick to what I happen to remember happened at the time. I'm old enough to remember what was said to Gorbachev in those days when the wall came down and all these things changed fundamentally. I was not optimistic that the NATO would adapt to that situation, but there was hope at that time. There's no hope today for this because if you could change, you would have changed long ago. So the prediction I make is the United States empire and NATO will fall apart at some point. Question is how, da how dangerous and how violent that process will be because it's not able, it's not able to conduct reforms or change itself fundamentally into something else, such as a common security uh, organization for Europe. Well, I actually wanted to ask you now about the solutions, um, but because you've been a peace researcher for many decades and <laughs> what, what would it take to peacefully resolve the immediate crisis? And secondly, how can we create the basis for a peaceful world in the future? And uh, you mentioned the idea that you had 30 years ago for uh, dismembering NATO uh, and help the uh, founder and international chairman of the Schiller Institute, Helge Tseplerouche, has now uh, called for establishing a new security architecture, which would take uh, the interests of all countries, including Russia, into account. So, how do you, how could we solve the immediate crisis if there were the political will? What would have to change uh, among the parties? And secondly, what what needs to be done in terms of uh, long-term uh, peaceful cooperation? <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, uh, the question you're raising is a little bit like the seventh doctor who is trying to operate on a patient who is bleeding to death and then saying, what should we do now? Uh, you know, what I have suggested over 30 years is something that should have been done to avoid the situation today. And nobody listened, uh, as is clear, because you don't listen to researchers anymore who say something else that state finance researchers do. Uh, so uh, it, it's not an easy question you're raising, of course. I would say, of course, in the immediate situation, the Minsk uh, uh, agreements, which has not been upheld particularly by Ukraine in establishing some kind of autonomy for the Donbas area. Now, that is something we could work with, autonomous solutions. We could work with confederations. We could work with or uh, cantonizations, if you will. Lots of what happened uh, happens in Eastern, uh, uh, in the Eastern republics of Ukraine. It reminds me of a country I know very well and uh, partly educated in and worked in during the dissolution, namely Yugoslavia. As so much that it resembles Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and Ukraine in Croatia, uh, it, it both means border areas. Ukraine means border. And there's so much that could have been transferred of knowledge and wisdom and lessons learned had we had a United Nations mission in that part, a peacekeeping mission, a monitoring mission, UN police and UN civil affairs in the Donbass region. If I remember correctly, Putin is the only one who suggested that at some point. I don't think he presented as a big proposal to the world, but in an interview or something, he said that was something he could think of. I wrote that in 2014. Why on earth has nobody even suggested that the United Nations, the world's most competent organization in handling conflicts, 
and um, if you will, put a lit on the military affairs, for instance, by disarming the parties on all sides, which they did in Eastern and Western Slavonia in Croatia. Uh, why has that not been suggested? Because the Western world has driven the United Nations out, of the, out to the periphery of international politics. And, you know, I've said Minsk, I've said the UN, I've said some kind of internal reforms in Ukraine. I have said, and I would, and I would insist on it, NATO must stop its expansion. NATO cannot take the risk on behalf of Europe and the world and saying we insist on continuing with giving weapons to and finally making Ukraine a NATO member. You can ask Kissinger. You can ask Brzezinski, you can take the most, if you will, right wing hawkish politicians in the West. They've all said neutrality like Finland or Switzerland or something like that is the only viable option. And is that to be pro-Russian? No, that is to be pro-Western. Because I am just looking like so many others fortunately have done at the Cuban Missile Crisis. What would the United States how would that have reacted if Russia had a huge military alliance and tried to get Canada or Mexico to become members with long range weapons standing, you know, a few kilometers from the US border? Do you think the US would have said, oh, they were all freely deciding too, so we think it's okay. Look at what they did at the Cuban Missile Crisis. They could not accept uh, weapon stations uh, at Cuba. So one of the things you have to ask yourself about, is there one rule and one set of interests for the Western world that does not apply to other actors? If you want to avoid Russia invading Ukraine, which all this nonsense is about repeatedly now for two or three months, look into a new status where the East and the West and Ukraine, all of it, can sit down and discuss security guarantees for Ukraine. Uh, President Zelensky has said it quite nicely, I must say, he said, if you don't want us to become members of NATO, and he says that to the West, because he feels that it has taken too long time for the West to act. And he last said that at the Munich Security Conference, I think yesterday or two days ago, by the way, interested in a man whose country is going to be invaded any moment, leaves the country and goes to a conference to speak, which he could have done on Zoom. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole thing doesn't make sense. Uh, like it didn't make sense, uh, or was it on the 18th or 17th, when all the West said that they are going to invade Ukraine and the Russian defense minister was sitting in Damascus mm -hmm. and Putin was receiving Bolsonaro. I mean, don't they have intelligence anymore in NATO and Washington? So uh, long story short, sit down and give Ukraine guarantees and non-aggression pact with, with um, both sides or all sides, um, uh, clearly limited non-nuclear uh, defensive defense measures along the borders or whatever. Um, integration in whatever Eastern and Western economic organizations. And I would be happy to see them as part of the Belt and Road Initiative with economic opportunities too. There's so much Ukraine could do if it could get out of the role of being a victim and squeezed between the two sides all the time. And that can only be done if you elevate the issue to a higher level in which Ukraine is different peoples and different part, uh, parts and parties uh, are allowed to speak up what future they want to have in the very specific situation that Ukraine is in. It is not any country in, in Europe. It's a poor country. It's a country that has a specific history. It's a country which is very complex, complex ethnically, language-wise, historically, etc. And that's why I started out saying confederation. Uh, I said something like a Switzerland model, something like cantonization or whatever. But for Christ's sake, give that country and its people a security, a good feeling that nobody's going to encroach upon you. And that is, to me, the, the, uh, 
the Schwerpunkt, you know, the, 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 the absolutely essential, that is to give the Ukraine people a feeling of safe, security and safety and stability and peace so that they can develop. I find it very interesting that President Zelensky in this very long interview to the international press a couple of weeks ago said, I, I, I'm paraphrasing it, but he says, I'm tired of all these people who say that we are going to be invaded because it destroys our economy. People are leaving, no business is coming in. Right. Who are we to do this damage to Ukraine and then wanted to become a member of NATO? You know, the whole thing is recklessly irresponsible in my view, particularly with a view to Ukraine and its peoples and their needs. So I would put that in focus and then uh, put in a huge UN uh, mission, uh, peacekeeping and continue and expand the uh, excellent OSCE mission uh, put the international community, good-hearted, neutral people down and diffuse those who have only one uh, eyesight, only one view on all this. They are the dangerous people. And what about the more long-term idea of a new security architecture in general? Oh, I would build a kind of, uh, I wouldn't say copy of, but I would I would build something insp inspired by the United Nations, a Security Council for all of Europe, um, representatives for all countries, including NGOs and not just government representatives. I would have an early warning mechanism where the moment there is something of like a conflict coming up, we would have reporters and we would have uh, investigations there. We would look into. Uh, not conflict prevention. My goodness, people don't read books. There's nothing about conflict prevention. We are prevent. We should, well, we should prevent this violence. We should probably pre prevent prevent violent conflict. But preventing conflicts is nonsense. Life is getting richer. There's not a family. There's not a school. There's not a workplace. There's not a political party. There's not a parliament in which there are no conflicts. Conflict is 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 what life is made of. Conflict is terribly important because it makes us change and reflect. I'm, I'm all for conflicts and I'm 110% against violence. But people will say conflict prevention is something we should work on and educate people in. Nonsense from people who never read books, as I said. So I would look for something like common security. The good old Palmer Commission from the 80s, which built on defensive defense, the idea that we all have a right according to Article 51 in, uh, in the UN Charter, everybody has a right to self-defense, but we do not have a right to missiles that can go 4,000 kilometers or 8,000 kilometers and kill millions of people far away. Get rid of nuclear weapons and all these things. It has nothing to do with defensiveness and common security. And I say that wherever I go and wherever I speak to, I say get rid of nuclear weapons and offensive long-range weapons. The only legitimate weapons there are in this world are defensive ones, and they are defined by two things. Short distance, short ability to go only over short distance, such as helicopters instead of, you know, fighter airplanes or missiles. And secondly, limited destructive capacity because they're going to be used on your own territory in case somebody encroaches or, or invades you. But nobody wants to have nuclear weapons or, or, or totally super destructive weapons on their own territory because they don't want them to be used there. So just ask yourself, what would you like in country X, Y and Z to, uh, to be defended with? And that's a definition of a defensive weapons. If we all had only defensive military structures, there would be very few wars, but there would also not be a military industrial media academic complex that earns some money on this. You know, the whole thing here that, that the, the, the big elephant in the room we are talking about is, well, there are two of them, is NATO expansion, which we should never have done this way. And secondly, it's the interest of the military, industrial, media, academic complex, MIMAC, as I call it, that earns a hell of a lot of money on people suffering and millions of people who at this moment while we speak are living in fear and despair because of what they see in the media is going to happen. None of what we see at this moment was necessary. Hmm. It's all made up by elites who have an interest in these kinds of things happening or the threat or the Cold War. And even if uh, we avoid a big war now, and I, I hope, I don't pray to anything, but I hope very much that we do, uh, thanks to some people's wisdom, it's going to be very cold in Europe in the future after this. Hmm. Look at the demonization. 
that the West has done again on Russia and to a certain extent of Ukraine. It, this is not psychologically something that you have repaired in two weeks. Yeah, and, and also, as you mentioned at the beginning, it has also something to do with, with uh, the unwillingness in part of certain of the Western elites to, to accept that we are not an Anglo-American unipolar world, but that there are other countries that need to be listened to and respected. Yeah, and you might add what, you, what, what the West gets out of this is that Russia and China will get closer and closer. You have already seen the common declaration, we will have friendship eternally. And that's between, between two countries who up to the 60s at some point were very strong enemies. And uh, the same will go with Iran. And there will be other countries like Serbia who are turning away from the West. We are going to sit and be isolating ourselves because one, we cannot bully the world anymore as we could before in the West. And secondly, nobody wants to be bullied anymore. We have to live in a world in which there are different systems. Mm. This Christian missionary idea that everybody must become like us, or we opened up to China because then we hope they would become liberal democracies with many parties and a parliament, is awfully naive. And time is over for that kind of thinking. I want to, before we have to end, I want to uh, go into the other two subjects. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, First, sure. Firstly, uh, the question of the negotiations between Denmark and the United States. Uh, in the context of this political, military, and media statements of recent years alleging that Russia has aggressive intentions against Europe and the US, uh, the Danish Social Democratic government announced on February 10th that a year ago, the US requested negotiations on a defense cooperation agreement, and that Denmark was now ready to start these negotiations. And the government announced that it could mean permanent stationing of US troops and armaments on Danish soil. And if so, this would be against the decades long policy of the Danish government not to allow foreign troops or armaments, armaments uh, permanently stationed in Denmark. And you wrote an article uh, two days later uh, criticizing the, these negotiations. Why are you against this? Well, I'm against it because it's a break of 70 years of sensible policies. We do not accept foreign weapons and we do not accept foreign troops and we do not accept uh, nuclear weapons station on Danish uh, soil. Um, I sat for 10 years, all the 80s, in the Danish government's commission for security and disarmament as an expert. Nobody in the 80s would have mentioned anything like this. I guess the whole thing is something that has begun to go mad around 20 years ago when Denmark engaged and became a bomber nation in first a time in Yugoslavia and then in you know, Afghanistan and Iraq and war. Uh, it means you cannot say no. This is an offer you can't refuse. And you can't refuse it, among other things, it's my interpretation because you remember the story where President Trump um, suggested that he or the US could buy Greenland and the uh, Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen said that well uh, that is not something to be discussed the question is absurd after which he got very angry he got personally very angry and he said it's not a matter of speaking to me you're speaking to the United States of America and I think this offer <laughs> to begin negotiations must have come relatively uh, shortly after that, as you know, this offer is not something you should call absurd once again. I know evidence for that, but if these negotiations started more than a year ago, we are back in the Trump administration. And secondly, what kind of democracy is that? We do not know what that letter in which the Americans asked to have negotiations about this, when it was written and what the content of it was. But what we hear is that a little more than a year ago, we began some negotiations about this whole thing. That is behind the back of the parliament and behind the back of the people. And then it's presented more or less as a fait accompli. There will be an agreement. The question is only, you know, nitty gritty, what is will be in it. 
In terms of substance, there is no doubt that any place where there would be American facilities, bases, sites, or whatever you'd call it, or weapons stored, will be the first targets in a war seen as such, uh, in a war under the present circumstances, seen by Russia. Russia's first targets will be to eliminate the, uh, the Americans everywhere they can in Europe, because they, those are the strongest and most dangerous forces. Secondly, <clears throat> It is not true that there is a no to nuclear weapons in other senses than Denmark will keep up the, the, the uh, principle that we will not have them stationed uh, permanently. But with such an agreement where uh, Air, Air Force, uh, uh, Navy and soldiers, uh, military, shall more frequently work with, come in to visit, etc. There's no doubt that there will be more nuclear weapons coming into, for instance, on American vessels than before, because the cooperation will be closer and closer. And there, the only thing the, American, the, the Danish government will do is, since they know the neither confirm nor deny policy of the US, they will not even ask the question. If they are asked by journalists, they will say, well, we take for granted that the Americans uh, honor uh, uh, or understand and respect that we will not have nuclear weapons on Danish territory, sea territory, air ter territory, or whatever. Now, the Americans are violating that in, uh, in, in Japan, even. So this is, this is nonsense. There will be more nuclear weapons. I'm not saying they will go off or anything. Like I'm just saying there will be more undermining of Danish principles. And then the whole thing, of course, has to do with the fact that Denmark is placing itself, and that was something the present government on Meta Frederiksen's leadership did before this uh, was made public, is to put 110% of your eggs in the US basket. This is the most foolish thing you can do given the world change. The best thing a small country can do is to uphold international law and the UN. Denmark doesn't, it speaks like the US for an international rules-based order, which is the opposite of, of very far away from the, the, the international law. And secondly, in a world where you are going to want multipolarity, a stronger Asia, stronger Africa, another Russia from the one we have known the last 30 years, etc., and a United States that is on all indicators except the military, declining and will fall as the world leader. This is, in my view, um, I'll be careful with my word here. The most foolish thing you can do at the moment if you are a leader of Denmark or if you're leading the Danish security politics, you should be open. I wrote an article about that in a small Danish book uh, some six or seven years ago and said, walk on two legs, mm -hmm. remain friendly with the United States and NATO and all that, but develop your other legs so you can walk on two legs in the next 20, 30, 40 years. But there's nobody that think that, that long term in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And there's nobody who thinks independently anymore. Research institutes or uh, ministries, it's basically adapting to everything we think or are told by Washington we should do. And that's not foreign policy to me. Mm. There's nothing to do with it. A good foreign policy is one where you have a good capacity to analyze the world, do scenarios, discuss which way to go, pros and contras and different types of futures, and then make a this uh, decision in your parliament based on a public discussion. That was what we did earlier, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And then also when you become a bomber nation, when you become a militaristic one, when active foreign policy means nothing but militarily active, then of course you are getting closer and closer and closer down into the, uh, into the darkness of the hole where suddenly you fall so deep that you cannot see the day daylight up uh, at, at where the where the hole is. I think it's very sad. I find it tragic. I find it very dangerous. I find that Denmark will be a much less free country in the future with doing these kinds of things. And you know, don't look at the base out uh, this this agreement as, as an isolated thing. It comes with all the things we've done, all the wars Denmark has participated in. Sorry, I said we, I don't feel Danish anymore, so I should say Denmark or the Danes. And also, and finally, I have a problem with democratically elected leaders who seem to be more loyal with a foreign government than with their own people's needs.
there we don't have much time but i wanted to get into the last question uh you just mentioned the lack of independence of uh analysis and there's not only an enemy image being pay, painted against Russia, but also against China, <laughs> with allegations of central government genocide against the Muslim Uyghur minority in Xinjiang province as a major point of contention. And on March 8th, 2021, uh, the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy in Washington published a report, the Uyghur genocide an examination of China's breaches of the 1948 Genocide Convention in cooperation with the Raoul uh, Wellenbach Center for Human Rights in Montreal. Hmm. And uh, the next month, April 27th, last year, you and two others issued a, a report which criticized this report. Um, what is the basis of your criticism and what do you think should be done to lessen tension with China. And also, as a wrap up uh, question in the end, if, uh, if you wanted to say anything else about what has to be done to make a change from looking at Russia and China as the autocratic enemies of the West, and to instead shift to a world in which there is cooperation between the major powers, which would give us the possibility of concentrating on such great tasks as economic development of the poor parts of the world. Well, of course, that's something we could speak another hour about. But <laughs> yeah, I'm what, sorry. What, what we did in our in our tiny think tank here, which, by the way, is totally independent and people financed and all volunteer. That's why we can say and do what we think should be said and done and not politically in anybody's hands or pockets is that those reports, including the New Lines uh, Institute's report, does not hold water, would not pass as a paper on a master's degree uh, in social science or political science. We say that if you look into not only that report, but several other reports and researchers who are contributing the, to this genocide discussion, <clears throat> if you look into their work, they are very often related to the military industrial media academic complex and they are paid for uh, have formerly had positions somewhere else in that system or uh, are known for having hawkish views on china russia and everybody else uh, outside the western sphere so when we began to look into this, we also began to see a trend. And that's why we published shortly after a 150 page report about the new Cold War on China. And Xinjiang is part of a much larger orchestrated. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. It's all documented in contrast to media and other research reports. It's is documented. You can see where we get our knowledge from and on which basis we draw conclusions. Where is now significant for Western scholarship that it doesn't deal on, and media it doesn't deal with are not interested in sources. I'll come back to that. It's part of a much larger only tell negative stories about China. Don't be interested in China's new social model. Don't be interested in how they in 30 to 40 years did what nobody else in humankind has ever done, uplifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and creating a society that I can see the difference from because I visited China in 1983. And I know what it looked like back then when they had just opened up, so to speak. And what we are saying is not that we know what happened in or happens in Xinjiang because we've not been there and we are not a human rights organization. We are conflict resolution, peace proposal making policy think tank. But what we do say is if you cannot come up with better arguments and more decent documentation, then probably you are not honest. If there's nothing more you can show us to prove that there's a genocide going on in Xinjiang, 
you should uh, perhaps do your homework before you make these um, uh, assertions and accusations. That's what we are saying. And we are also saying that it is peculiar that the last thing Mike Pompeo, Trump's foreign minister, Secretary of State, uh, did in his office, I think on the 19th of January last year, was to say, I hereby declare that Xinjiang is a genocide. And State Department has still to publish as much as one A4 page with the documentation. So, you know, I feel sad on a completely different level, and that is Western scholarship is disappearing in this field. And those who may really make different views, analyses, and question what we hear, or uphold a plurality of viewpoints and interpretations of the world, we're not listened to. I mean, I'm listened to elsewhere, but I'm not listened to in Western media, although I have 45 years of experience in these things and have traveled quite a lot and worked in quite a lot of conflict and war zones. Uh, I can live with that, but I think it's a pity for the Western world that we are now so far down the drain that good scholarship is not what politics built on anymore. If it, you know, I think it was at a point in time. So what is also striking to me is very quickly, the uniformity of the press. They have all written, the day that Newsline report that you referred to was published, it was all over the place, including front pages of the leading Western newspapers, including Dan Danish broadcasting's website, etc. All saying the same thing, quoting the same bits of parties from it. The uniformity of this is just mind boggling. How come that nobody said, hey, what is this New Lines Institute, by the way, that nobody had heard about before? Who are these people behind it? Who are the authors? Anybody can sit on their chair and do a, quite a lot of research, which was impossible to do 20 years ago. If you're curious, if you're asked to be curious, if you are permitted to be curious and do research, in the media, in the editorial office where you are sitting, then you would find out that lots of this here is BS. Sorry to say so intellectually, it's BS. And so I made a little pastime. I write a very diplomatic letter to people at CNN, BBC, Reuters, etc., Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish media, those who write this opinion journalism about Xinjiang and a couple of other things. And I send them more our report, which is online, so it's just a link, you know, and I say, kindly read this one, and um, I look forward to hearing from you. I've done this in um, about 50 or 60 cases, individually dug up their email addresses, etc. There is not one who has responded anything. The strategy when you lie is, or when you deceive, or when you have a political mandate is, don't go into any dialogue with somebody who knows more or is critical of what you do. That is very sad. Our TFF press infos go to 20 people on BBC. They know everything we do about Ukraine, about China, about Xinjiang, etc. Not one has ever called. Mm. You know, these are the kinds of things that make me scared as an intellectual. Mm. One thing is what happens out in the world. That's bad enough. But when I begin to find out how is this going on, how is this manipulated internally in editorial offices close to foreign ministries, et cetera, or defense ministries, then I say, you know, we are approaching the Pravda moment. The Pravda moment is not the present Pravda, but the Pravda that went down with the Soviet Union. When I visited Russia, uh, couple, uh, Soviet Union at a time for conferences, etc., and I found out that very few people believed anything they saw in the media. Now, to me, it's a question of whether the Western media, so-called free media, want to save themselves or, and, or they want to become totally irrelevant. Because at some point, as someone once said, you cannot lie all the time to all the people. Yeah. You President, may get away with lying for some, pe for some people for some other time. President Lincoln. Yeah. So the long story short is, this is not good. This deceives people. And of course, some people, at some point, people will be very upset about that they have been lied to. Mm -hmm. And also don't make this um, reference anymore to free and state media. 
you are uh, viewers may like to see that, to hear that or may not like it but should know it the us has just passed a law they have three laws against china um how to intervene in all kinds of things chinese such as for instance uh, trying to influence who will become the successor to dalai lama and things like that they are not finished at all on how to uh, influence taiwan and all that uh, things they have nothing to do with and which they decided between nixon and Chu and Lai that America accepted the one China policy and would not mix themselves into Taiwanese issues, but that is all oh, another broken promise. Um, these media are state media in the US. If you take the Radio Free Europe and the Radio Free Asia, they are those, particularly the latter, who have disseminated most of this Xinjiang genocide stories, which then bounce back to BBC, etc. These are state media. There's an agency for that in, the, in Washington. It's financed by millions of dollars, of course, and it has a mandate to make a foreign, American foreign policy more understood um, and promote US foreign policy goals and views. That's you, anybody can go to a website and see this. You know, I, I, again, I'm back to this. Everybody can do what I've done. Mm. And that law that has just been passed says the U.S. sets off $1,500 million, that's $1.5 billion the next five years, to support education, training courses, whatever, for media people to write negative stories about China, particularly the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, I look forward to Politiken or Dagens Nyheter or whatever newspapers in the allied countries who would say this comes from a state US media when it does. And so that's my, my view is there is a reason for calling it the military industrial media academic complex, because it's one cluster of elites who are now running the deception, but also the, the wars that are built on deception. And that is very sad, where instead we should cooperate. I would not even say we should morally cooperate. I would say we have no choice on this earth but to cooperate. Because if we have a new Cold War between China and, and, and uh, the West, we cannot solve humanity's problems, whether it's the you know, climate issue, environmental issues, it's poverty, it's uh, justice, uh, income differences or cleavages or um, modern technological problems or whatever. You take all these things, they are by definition global. And if we have one former empire, soon former empire, that does nothing but disseminate negative energy, criticize, demonize, running cold wars, basically isolating itself and going down. We lack America to do good things. I've never been anti-American. I want to say that very clearly. I've never, ever been anti-American. I'm anti-empire and militarism. And we need the United States with its creativity, with its possibilities, with the world it already has given the world to also contribute constructively to a better world together with the Russians, together with Europe, together with Africa, together with everybody else and China, and stop this idea that we can only work with those who are like us, because if that's what you want to do, you will have fewer and fewer to work with. The world is going through towards diversity. And we have other cultures coming up who have other ways of doing things, and we may like it or not. But the beauty of conflict resolution and peace is to do it with those who are different from you. It is not to make peace with those you already love or are already completely identical with. This whole thing is, is unfortunately a conflict and peace illiteracy that has now overtaken completely the Western world. Whereas I, I see people thinking about peace, I hear people mentioning the, world, the word peace. I do not hear Western politicians or media anymore mention the world peace. And that when that word is not, and the discussion and the discourses disappeared about peace, we are very far out. 
Combine that with lack of intellectualism and analytical capacity, and you will end up with militarism and war. You cannot forget these things and then avoid a war. So in my view, there are other reasons than Russia, <laughs> if you will, that we're in a dangerous situation and that uh, danger has to do with the West's operating itself at the moment. Nobody in the world is threatening the United States or the West. If it goes down, it's all of its own making. And I think that's an important thing to say these days when we always blame somebody else for our problems. That is not the truth. Thank you so much, Jen.